praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praise to our God. For it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of their stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heaven with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Come then, let us reason together says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The office of the keys is the special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not where is this written? This is what St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Good day to you. Today we are going to be in Matthew chapter 9, continuing this theme of confession as well as the office of the keys, focusing on that fifth chief part of Luther's small catechism. And so let me bring that up on the screen for you. So it writes, Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Now, before we get to the next few verses, I want to look at this passage. So, this is a one of those great healing moments in Jesus' ministry. Now, you don't have the detail in Mark's gospel, where it shows the level of faith of the of the the friends of this man, and that's okay because that's because here we're not focusing on that. We're focusing on 
the exchange between Jesus and the crowd and what's going on. And we're going to read in a little bit about um, somebody who is nearby. But so the first thing Jesus does, so this paralytic is brought before Jesus. And what's you see it, the very first thing he does, he says, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees believe that Jesus is the scribe, sorry, the scribes, sorry. Some of the scribes thought he was blaspheming. So blasphemy, just to give you background, the word blasphemy, it's a sin, and it's, it's a grievous sin. It's a sin of claiming that something, someone is God that isn't, or something is God that isn't. And in this case, when Jesus forgave sins, as far as the scribes were concerned, Jesus was claimed to be God. And there's truth to this. Um, to give you an understanding, so... If I were to go up, let's say I just randomly went up to someone and just punched him in the face. I don't know why. I just did just for the fun of it. Because maybe I'm a really aggressive person or something. <clears throat> so I punch this guy or whatever. Who is, so after I've done this and I'm seeking forgiveness, who is the only person that could forgive me for that sin? Can I go to some guy that happened to be, you know, down the street or whatever and say, hey, can you forgive me for me punching this guy, this other guy? No, I can't. That doesn't work because I didn't sin against the guy down the street. I would have sinned against the person I punched. The only person that could forgive me is the guy who I sinned against, right? So when Jesus has this paralytic brought to him, he doesn't say, like, I forgive you because you dropped on my toe. He forgave him for every single sin he had ever committed. And the only way he could do that is if he is the person whom every single sin is committed against. And that person is God. That's why they call it blasphemy, because they knew that the only one who had authority to forgive the sins of every, every single sin would be God. And that's why, you know, so they say, Jesus says, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which it's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. It's really interesting when people read that. People want to go to a moralistic, well, it's so much easier to say, rise and go walk, than to say, forgive. They'll go into this forget moralistic thing, and they're not reading. The, the thought that Jesus is blaspheming is key. This isn't a moralistic tale. This is telling you who... Jesus is. It's about his identity. It's not about you. People really love to go. There's what is um, Chris Roseboro. He's a he's a podcaster. He does fighting for the faith. Wonderful podcast to listen to. Just don't listen to a whole lot because you'll begin to get really negative about things. Because his whole job is a discernment blogger, and so he watches. He listens to sermons of mega treachery mega church preachers and stuff like that and basically his goal is to warn people against false theology and the dangers surrounding christianity and like i said very good to listen to to keep to guard yourself against a lot of the ways the devil is working in the world but anyways in his podcast in his podcast he's coined this term that's called narcissist jesus narcissism means is it means love of oneself Isa Jesus. It's a it's a fancy theological term. So Isa E I S Jesus, J, not J E S U S, but E I S G E S I S. That's Isa Jesus. Isa Jesus is when you read something into the text that is not there. So Narsa Jesus. So this is the term that he coined. Narsa Jesus is where you read yourself into the text. And that's the whole thing, where you make the passage about you when it's not about you. And this is one of those passages people really tend to narcissate. When it's not about you, it's really about Jesus. Who is he? And so what he says, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to, rise, to say rise and walk? Now, technically, both are e equally easy to say. Because you're just saying words. What he's meaning is which is easier to say and actually carry authority behind those words, right? And the answer is neither. They're equally difficult because the person 
who could say to this man that your sins are forgiven and they actually are forgiven. And the person who could say to this paralytic, take up your mat and walk, and he actually is able to do it, is the same person. So in other words, so when Jesus says, <clears throat> but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. What he is doing is he's showing to the scribes that yes, I have that authority. Because the one who could tell this paralytic to take up his mat and walk is the same one who could tell this paralytic you all of your sins are forgiven. And that is God in the flesh. And by the way, this leads to a second question. Why did Jesus forgive his sins before healing his paralysis? Now there's, I mean, there's one possibility is that he's worried the guy would just go and leave. But the real reason, probably the bigger reason is that out of the two things that he did, one of them he needed more. He needed forgiveness more than he needed healing of paralysis. Um, some of you who are older know that eventually in life, your joints just don't work the way they used to, right? The same thing's going to happen with this man. Even though Jesus healed him of his paralysis, eventually he's going to not be able to walk around very well again. I mean, that's just the reality. He's going to get, he's going to probably get sick at some point. He's going to become weak. He's going to become frail. And eventually that man's going to die. And when that point comes, the thing that's going to need, above all, is the forgiveness of Christ. Because forgiveness, where there is forgiveness, there is life and salvation. So Jesus began with forgiveness because that was what was needed the most. So let's keep going here. Verse 9, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a, phys of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now note, this is... This conversation that's going on here between Jesus and the ta and the um, and the Pharisees is very similar to what we heard um, last week when we were reading about the parable of the prodigal son. And so you have this whole thing: he's eating with tax collectors and sinners, of whom Matthew, who he just called, is a tax collector. And it's very intriguing is that in the Gospel of Matthew, so the person who's writing these words is Matthew. The very same gospel, right? The very person that was called right in this moment is the same one who is um, who is writing these words. And so, and it's very intriguing that if you read in the Gospel of Luke or Mark, he's referred to uh, referred to as Levi, but here he's called Matthew, and it's of my belief. It's of my. I mean, this is again. This is kind of speculative. But it appears as if Matthew is trying to um, do a little bit of wordplay. Because Matthew was his name as well. It's, it's one of those things in, in their culture, most people seem, a lot of the people seem to have two names. Matthew, Levi, Simon, Peter, etc., etc. And But the thing that's interesting is the Greek word, the name Matthew, Sounds very, very similar to the Greek word for disciple. And the word disciple, me, the Greek word is Matthias. And which sounds, you hear it, Matthias, Matthew. Matthias, Matthew. If you look at it, sound, you hear it, it sounds very similar. And note, right after he says, man called Matthew, follow me. What does the word disciple mean? Literally means follower 
or student. But so he's saying, follow me. Be my student. Be my pupil. Be my disciple. Be my Matthias. And so Matthew's kind of playing with words there. And it's very note that it is Matthew's gospel that concludes the, that sentence. Go and make disciples. Go and make Matthias of all nations. But anyway, so but Matthew is a tax collector. And so he's at a tax booth because he's a tax collector. And tax collectors, as I talked about last week, were de despised by the culture because they were considered traitors, um, collecting taxes from their own, from fellow Jews to give to the e uh, enemy occupying Romans. And so ta tax collectors were generally not liked. And so this is why they're grumbling. And the thing was, is in um, that that culture. It was very important who you chose to eat your meals with. The people who you ate your meals with was a matter of status. And if you ate with the wrong people, this would it would be bad for your reputation. And and at this point, the ta the Pharisees more likely more than likely at this point, they're not being critical of Jesus. They're concerned for Jesus. It might be at this point that they're thinking, you know, Jesus, you realize that this is not going to do anything for your reputation. You need to be eating with people like us. Um, you know, people who have good reputations. Otherwise, people are going to think you're the wrong sort. Eating with these tax collectors and sinners. But as Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And see, Jesus is the great physician. We are sinners. And the thing is that the Pharisees did not get was that they were in the same position as these tax collectors and so-called sinners that they in fact are sinners they in fact are not righteous and they in fact should be sitting there and eating with him just the same because they need him just the same and you need him not because you're righteous but because you're not you need him who makes you righteous and so he invites you to his table, for he makes sinners like you and me righteous. So, let's continue with prayer. O Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We conclude. We conclude with the hymn of the week, which again, as I mentioned yesterday, the hymn, um, the words in the hymn are not the same in the recording as you will see on screen. So, but still listen to it in, or sing to it hopefully even, and be edified by it. And notice how much it connects with our theme of the Office of the Keys and Confession and Absolution. So, we continue. 